and today we are going to talk about the church at Philadelphia and the church that Jesus wants fulfills its assignments. The scripture comes from Revelation chapter 3 verses 7 through 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. <clears throat> what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is, coming, that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. This is the word of God for God's people. And so we're going to talk about briefly for the Church of Philadelphia. And Jesus begins this discussion with this church much like he began all the other discussions with the previous churches. He starts off by discussing some of his attributes and what he needs them to know about him before he tells the church what he wants them to know about themselves and the next phase of what he needs to tell them. And so I'll start off with the three things about himself that Jesus tells the church at Philadelphia. The first thing is he says he who is holy or translated in the Greek literally means the holy one. The word holy in its most basic form means to be set apart. And I used to hear when I was a child and even as a grown up, I used to pe hear people say, you know, quote the scripture, be ye holy as I am holy and talk about how holiness is a way of life and we need to be set apart. And I always used to think some, sometimes, not always, but most of the time I would think that's a very hard thing to do. How can we as humans even come close to being holy as God is holy in our flesh? And so what I learned is what God was trying to tell the church at Philadelphia. We as human can never be holy in and of ourselves. We need the power and the work of the Holy Spirit because being set apart for the work of God is not an easy task, but it's possible in the Holy Spirit. And so we become holy when we are set apart when we choose to be set apart to be God's possessions in order to serve not our own purposes or not our own things, but in order to serve his purposes and to be in his manifest presence. All throughout the scripture, God is identified as being holy. He is identified as being holy so much that in Revelations 4 and 8, we are told that in heaven, the way that God is worshipped day and night by the creatures and the hosts in heaven is that they declare, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come and who is to come. God is holy. And this is what he wants the church at Philadelphia to know. But he wants them not only to know that he's holy, in his being but he's holy in everything that he does and so the second thing that God wants the church at Philadelphia to know is that he is the true God which in the Greek is translated literally the true one Jesus is declaring in this statement that there is nothing false 
nothing deceptive, nothing crooked, or as we say in Detroit, Michigan, there is nothing shady about him. He is the real deal. As a matter of fact, he is so real that the scripture declares in John 14 and 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So he needs the church at Philadelphia to know, first of all, that he is holy and there is absolutely no being in heaven or on earth who is like him and that he is the true God. There is nothing fake or superficial or phony about him. He is who he says he is. And so why does he need the church at Philadelphia to know this? He's also true and a holy God because the scripture says this, he was tempted in all points, yet as we were, yet without sin. And so him being true God, he was able to fulfill his father's commission to live on the earth and walk amongst the people and not even be entangled in the affairs and the dealings of the world. And so that's one of the things that makes him the true God. But why did he need the church at Philadelphia to know this before he could go on to tell them about fulfilling their assignment? It was because he needed them to know that he was faithful and that he could be trusted. He could be trusted. Not only could he be trusted, his word could be trusted and whatever, just like the song we got finished saying, whatever he has promised and said that he would do, he needed the church at Philadelphia to go into this thing knowing, I am who I say I am and I can do exactly what I said I can do. And so just as he was faithful in his life on earth, He's a faithful father right now, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, uh, making intercession for us. So much so that he promised that even after he left this earth, he said, he told the church, I will be with you always. He told his disciples, don't worry, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the earth. And so he wants the church at Philadelphia to know that even when others are not with them, he will be. He wants them to be like him when he was in his human nature, not perfect because we, we won't achieve that, but we can strive for perfection. But he wanted them to know that it was possible for them to also be set apart, filled with the Holy Spirit and living daily, listen, living daily in the manifest presence of God. And the Lord just, just put this in my mouth. You know, we do not have to uh, we do not have to relegate ourselves to a Sunday only manifest presence of God. I'm so glad that I serve a Savior and a God whose manifest presence can be with me as long as I am with him in my car, in my house, at the schoolhouse, at the bank, in Walmart. And so we do not have to wait to experience the manifest presence of God when we get here on Sunday. Amen. We can experience and we should as blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled believers experience the manifest presence of God all the time in every area of our life. And so he wants them to know all of these things about himself because he needs to get them to their next position, their next assignment. And so he wants them to know that it is possible for them to be faithful and fulfill their assignment. And then the third attribute that Jesus mentioned about himself is that he now has the key of David in his hand and he is the one who will open the doors that no man can shut and shut the doors that no one will be able to open. And so this is what happened in the scripture early on. God made a promise to David that he would give he and his sons the kingdom that they would rule over God's people, but not for their own purposes, but for them to be able to accomplish what God needed for them to accomplish on the earth. And so that lets us know that God can and he will open doors when he sees fit to accomplish his purposes. Sometimes we're waiting on God to open doors and do things and it's not always for our purposes, but God, when it's for his purposes and it's going to accomplish what he needs for us to accomplish on the earth, he will open it, he will shut it, but only as he sees fit. We have an example in scripture, a man named Shevna in Isaiah 22, 15 through 25. The prophet Isaiah talks about this man named Shevna who was in charge of the royal household. 
He was the highest ranking official, and he was assigned to the responsibility to faithfully execute the affairs of the kingdom of God according to God's will and purpose. But in this 22nd chapter of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah goes on to tell us that Shebna abused his power. He used the keys and the power that, and authority that God had given him for his own purposes. He was no longer interested in what the purpose of God was and what the needs of the kingdom were, but he used it for selfish gain. And you know how we do here on earth and prosperity and to get accolades from other people and to gain status. He was not faithful to the calling associated with his assignment. And so he began to use the things of God in a way that he, would, he should not have used them. And so then God speaks a word of rebuke through the prophet Isaiah and he says, I am going to take everything that I have given away from you and I am going to replace you with my servant who will obey. And so he rebuked him and replaced him with Eliakim. And I pronounced that three or four different ways who he called his servant. So he stripped him of what he had given him, his authority, his power, because he was using it in the wrong way. And as I was preparing this message and as I go on to the third time of trying to preach and teach it, I still think the same thing. Lord, please don't ever let me take the power and the influence and the anointing that you have given me and use it for my purposes and that's so much so that you have to strip me from it and give it to somebody else because I'm abusing the power and the authority and the grace that you have given me. And so that should be our prayer. And so God needed them to know these things about himself because he needed them to know that he was holy, that he was the true one, and that the keys that he had, he actually was supposed to have them and they belonged to him, and that with these keys, he had authority and power. And this is the last time I'll tell this joke today, but when I came here, they gave me some keys and they told me that my keys would open almost every door in the church. But they pointed to a couple of doors and they said, your key will not open this door and your key will not open that door. And if you wanna get in one of those rooms, you're gonna to have to see the people who have what I call the master keys because they can open any door in the house, any door on anything in this campus. And so I have keys, but my keys are not the master keys. They're just the keys that need to get me into where I need to get into to handle my business and sometimes, but there are two people in this church and maybe three who have master keys and so they have the authority to let you in let me in lock us out of any place in this building because they have the master keys this is what Jesus was trying to tell the church at Philadelphia by giving them, them this analogy about the keys he says now not only am I true not only am I holy, but the keys that I have, I have the power to allow you to use them. And I have the power to open doors and shut doors. And I am the master locksmith. So when I unlock the door, nobody can lock it back up. And by George, when I lock the door, nothing else but me unlocking the door can make it open again. How many of us want to walk through some doors that God has opened? And how many of us, if we're smart, would like to stay on the other side of some doors that God has closed? Amen. And so he's telling the church at Philadelphia, this is who I am, but now I have something to tell you. After talking about himself, the Lord moves into what he knows about this church like he did with the other churches. Now, if you recall, he told some of the other churches, I know your works, that you would do this and you do that, and I know about you and you used to do this and you've lost your first love and a whole bunch of other things. He had a rebuke for them, most of the other churches, all of the other churches before we get to this one. But notice in the scripture, all he says to this church is, I know your deeds. He simply says to them, I know your deeds. And then he says, behold, which is kind of like saying, now look, because I know your deeds, this is what I am going to do. He didn't speak a negative word. He went into giving them what they needed to know. And so 
two things that he told them. He says, you have little power. And when we think about power, most times we think about our money power, we think about our influential power, we think about people power, we think about, you know, big church, little church, mega church, that kind of thing, that kind of power. The power that we as humans can exert over one another or manipulate things. But this is not the kind of power that Jesus was telling the church at Philadelphia that they had a little of. He was speaking of the power that is talked about in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, where he says, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high, speaking about the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. And so what he was telling the church at Philadelphia is, I realize that because of what I have done, you have a little power. And you say, preacher, what do you mean by what he has done? What he meant was is that he, God, chose how much power he was going to give to the people, when he was going to give it to it, and how much effect it was going to have. And so what Jesus acknowledges is you have had a little power because it hasn't been time for me to unleash all my power. It hasn't been time for me to release my power full throttle because it, it, it wasn't it wasn't the season. And earlier today, I used a different song, but as we were singing the worship song, there is a cloud. It says, like a flood, like a flood, we receive your rain. Anybody ever been in the flood? Anybody ever thought you were about to be in the flood when it was raining this morning and the water started to come down and I walked out my front door and I had to put my rain boots on and I thought, by George, I am going to get swept away on the way to the car or at best, I'm going to have water up to my kneecaps when I get to the church. And so I imagine a flood. And so when God says that he's opening doors that no man can shut, the illustration I used earlier today was that of a ship and a sail. But when we were doing this, I thought about the Holy Spirit coming upon us like a flood, something that just overwhelms you and just swallows you up. And all you can do, you, get, you either got to sink or you have to swim. And so I thought about it as we receive, we're singing this song, we receive your rain. So God was speaking to the church at Philadelphia saying, I'm about to open the floodgates of my spirit and I am about to open up a door that no man can shut. And when I open up that floodgates, it's going to be like a rushing mighty wind and the water is going to overtake you and you're going to be flooded with my Holy Spirit. And so he says, he is telling them that they've had a little power, but he's about to get them to the full power the full throttle ahead where they're overwhelmed with the Spirit. And then the second thing that he says to them is that, I see and I know that you have been persecuted, but that you have still stood in obedience. Now let's go back to the behold. He said, I know your deeds. I know that you have had little power, and so I'm about to unleash my full power. And number two, and I know that you have been persecuted, but you have stood in obedience to my word. And he says, because you have kept my word and have not denied my name, even in the face of those who claim to be Jews, or let's bring it to today, even to, in the face of those who claim to be Christians, even those who claim to be a part of the household of faith, even for those who claim to have spiritual gifts and talents, but they're lying, they don't act like it, they have, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They say they live this way, but they actually live another way. He says, even in the face of those people who are saying that they have kinship with you, they're lying, he said, even in the face of them, I will make them bow down and they will know that I have loved you because you have had a little power, but in the face of persecution, you have kept my word and been obedient. Anybody want that to be God's testimony about them? In the face of persecution and not experiencing the fullness of the Spirit, you still have been obedient and you have kept God's word and his commands. He doesn't declare this love for any, any of the other churches. He declares this love for the church at Philadelphia. For John 14 and 2 says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. 
the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. And so he's saying to them, not only will I show myself to you in the love that I have, but in the face of your enemies and those who are lying and pretending like they're Christians, and even in the face of those who are with you, I will declare my love openly. That's my prayer that when God looks at us as a church and me as a Christian and us as a body, that he will be able to declare openly, that is my child because they keep my commandments and I so love them that I am going to open some doors and give them some more power so their little power and their great persecution seem like to some people may have been something bad but their little power and their great persecution and then their obedience made them ready for God to give them their next assignment the time of little power taught them that aside from the Holy Spirit and what he gives you you can't do anything how many of you have tried to do something in your own power and in your own might and you have said to yourself or to somebody man I sure keep trying to do this thing and it is just not working or if I could just have a little more of this what the church at Philadelphia learned was that they had no power aside from what God gave them and what we can take from that is we have no power except for if the Holy Spirit floods us and we receive the rain that he floods us with. We have no power in and of ourselves. And so they also found out in the time of testing that God's grace was sufficient and that his strength was made perfect in weakness because sometimes we go through great moments of testing and we, and we feel like we can't make it and, and we, we want God to remove it. And sometimes he talks to us like he did his servant Paul. And he says, you say, oh Lord, I could do more for you. I could experience more power of the Holy Spirit if you would just take this thing that is weighing me down. But the church at Philadelphia learned that we need to learn that God says his grace is sufficient and his strength is made perfect in weakness. It might not seem like it right now, but oh, when you realize it and you get that full power. And so in being obedient to God's word and being strengthened, they learn what their next assignment was. And so God says to them, you have now been tested and tried, and I believe you're really set apart for me, and you mean this thing. In the face of whatever goes on, Heritage is going to be one of those churches that's going to stand for the word of God. In the face of whatever goes on, he says, Heritage is going to be one of those places that still worships a true and a living God. And so like the church at Philadelphia, he may be saying to us, now that I see this and I know this, I'm going to open up doors for you that no man can shut. I have given you not only access, but he'll give you over, I'll give you oversight. See, it's one thing to have a key and to have access, but it's another thing to be like the other two key holders or three key holders and be able to oversee what everybody else does. Because you know, there are some people who you will give access to your things and then you'll take the access back, but you don't want them over the whole thing because they can't be trusted and there's no telling what they would do. The Lord was saying to the church at Philadelphia, not only am I going to give you the power and the key, I'm going to give you oversight to go with it. And so he's saying, the spiritual realm, the conditions are right for natural things to start to happen. And I equate that with the weatherman. You know, Garrett Lewis gets on there and he rolls up his sleeves and depending on how far he rolls up his sleeves, that's how we know how serious it is. Well, I look at it like that. God was telling the church at Philadelphia, his sleeves were already up. He says the, the spiritual realm is ripe and the conditions are okay for a tornado, for a wind of my spirit to come through. And so when the wind of my spirit comes through, then things will start to happen on earth as they do in heaven. People will start to be delivered. They will be saved. They will be set free. The church of God will be able to arise and go to mission fields and countries where we never thought we could go when the spiritual ram and the door has been opened only God has in his hand and knows what can happen here on earth and so John 
I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul in Colossians 4 and 3. He asked the church, he said, pray for us that God may open a door for our message. That needs to be our prayer. That God would open a door for the message of salvation and the message of deliverance and the message of the infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which we are in chains. And so if we're going to be the church that Jesus wants and we're going to fulfill our assignment, I came up with three questions. And with these three questions, there are four things that we need to realize and keep in mind even as we are answering these three questions. And the first question is, what areas of specific assignment have you been called to? God opens doors for specific churches and specific people in specific places for specific kinds of ministry. And so in order for us to fill our assignments, after we ask ourselves what area of ministry or specific assignment is God calling us to in order to help the, the larger church, in order to help the kingdom fulfill its purpose, we have to remember this. We have to work, move, and serve in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if you work, move, and serve within your own power, you become tired, you become burnt out, you become bitter, you become disgruntled, and then you just don't accomplish anything. But if you work and move and serve in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll have joy unspeakable. You'll be able to do things that you never thought that you could accomplish. You will have power that you never, ever thought could be in your hands in order for you to do God's work. And the second thing we have to do is we have to be like the church at Philadelphia. Even after we realize what our specific calling in ministry is, we have to be willing to obey. Now, my mother-in-law used to always be going around saying obedience is better than sacrifice, and it sounded something like this. We would say that we were going, she told us to do something, and then we would do something else, and then she'd come back and say, but obedience is better than sacrifice. You just need to do what I told you to do and leave the other alone. It kind of works like that with God. Sometimes we, we want to do other things, and, and there may be good things, but they're not the thing that God is asking us to do. The songwriter put it like this, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his way, what a in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. And then the chorus says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey church we have to learn like the church at Philadelphia we want to be called the obeying church and so the third thing you have to remember is this remember that where God moves Satan opposes and what do we mean by that whenever God is trying to set up something good to happen know that the enemy is not happy and he will try to oppose whatever it is that God is setting up Ephesians 6 and 12 says it like this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so sometimes we're fighting, we're fighting the enemies, or we think we're fighting the enemies that are amongst us, and we're looking at people, and it's not even them. It's that Satan is opposing where God is trying to move, just like he did in the Bible days. And then the fourth thing is, if we're going to know what areas we have been specifically assigned to and we're going to be able to work on them, we have to remember that God will be faithful to what he has promised. For he is the Holy One, which means there's none like him and none beside him, and nobody can do what he can do. And he is the true God. He is the real deal. There is nothing fake, nothing superficial. There is nothing shady about him. So if he gives us an assignment and we remember these things, he can help us to fulfill them. And so then the second question is, in what ways have you seen victory in your life that give you the courage to move forth in your assignment? The church at Philadelphia saw that if they were faithful and if they were obedient, 
God moved them to the next level of assignment, which was the open door that no man can shut. Some of us have had victories or we have seen victories in other people's lives, in the church life, and in our spiritual lives. And so that ought to give us courage when we hear God's voice to obey, and that ought to give us courage to move on to our next assignment. Because after all, we serve a faithful God who would do what he has promised. He's the only true and living one, and he is the real deal. And so then the last question, what do you need to let go of? Or what do we need to acquire to fulfill our specific assignment and to help the church fulfill its assignment because we're, we're in this thing together and so if I'm not walking and fulfilling my assignment then that means that something in the body is lacking if you're not walking and fulfilling your assignment then that means that something in the body is lacking and sometimes I need to ask God God what do you need LaToya to get more of or what do you need LaToya to get rid of in order for me to be able to walk in this calling and walk in this assignment that you have given me and if for no other reason than what Revelations 3 and 11 says, we want to be able to let go of what we need to let go of and get what we need in the spirit so that we can fulfill our assignment because Revelations 3 and 11 says this, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. How many of you want to be in a church where we hold on to what we have, what God has taught us? We hold on to his word and we're obedient in the spirit so that when he does come back, we will be able to keep our crown and no one will be able to take it from us. I know I want to be in, in, in that number that he'll be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Now let me make you ruler over many. And by the way, you get to keep your crown because you have held on to my word and you have allowed the floodgates of the spirit to move through you and my child you have fulfilled your assignment and so the church that Jesus wants fulfills its assignment what are we being called to do today our ultimate goal our ultimate assignment is for us to go and to teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit so that they can receive what we have received and they can have what we have and so that's our ultimate assignment. And so how are we going to fulfill that? How are we going to move in the spirit? And how are we going to work together to fulfill the assignment and be the church that Jesus wants? Amen.